This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show coming at you, as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio, the Stephen A. Smith Show. Number to call up as always is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. Um, on this particular day, lots to talk about on the NFL level, NFL playoffs that took place yesterday. I can't believe the miracle I witnessed. Uh, Minnesota beating New Orleans. I'll tell you why I'm so ticked off about it. We'll get into the Steelers. Days of the Steel Curtain are going. I can tell you that much. I'll explain why in just a few moments. Obviously, we're expecting to have Ryan Clark on the show at 30 minutes past the hour uh, to highlight for us what transpired during yesterday's games in particular, but the weekend games throughout because Philadelphia did beat Atlanta and 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 New England did have the bye week that I thought they'd have by trouncing the Tennessee Titans. We'll get into all of that in just a few minutes and then some. Uh, but before I did anything, it's only appropriate to recognize that today is the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This is Martin Luther King holiday. Um, take a moment, particularly if you're an African-American, to pay homage and to give thanks uh, to that man for all he stood for, all he represented, arguably the greatest civil rights leader in history, um, certainly one of the greatest civil rights leaders ever um, on a day like today is not a day that <clears throat> I customarily feel the need to take off. I appreciate the fact that it's a federal holiday. It's certainly something that I endorse wholeheartedly, but in terms of my ability to reach millions upon millions of people via radio, television, and digital, um, I think it's apropos to take a moment to give thanks to a man uh that was such a fighter, such a warrior on behalf of all of us as citizens and human beings uh, to make sure that we have civil rights and that we're treated accordingly. I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in today if it were not for the efforts and the sacrifices of somebody such as him, a great man that I honor and revere every day of my life. So I just wanted to take a moment to give thanks, and pay homage to him for all that he's meant to all of us. And throughout this show today, particularly when we come out of the commercial breaks, you'll hear some sound uh, from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, I hope you can appreciate where I'm coming from with all of that. 888-SAY-ESPN is the number to call. That's 888-729-3776. It's time for some Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Best Phones, Best Networks, No Contracts. Brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. (sighs) I really don't know what to say. I cannot believe what I saw. I cannot believe what I saw take place in Minneapolis, Minnesota last night. After a putrid first half performance where Drew Brees and the New Orleans Saints offense could do absolutely positively nothing. And Case Keenum with Stephon Diggs and, 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 and Latavius Murray and the rest of the crew looked like gangbusters. What do you see? You see Drew Brees resurrect himself and remind the world of his greatness. That he is not somebody to be taken lightly. That he is not somebody to be summarily dismissed and counted out. And Drew Brees came out, came out in that second half and put on a show. And as a result, a touchdown to Michael Thomas. Another touchdown to rookie Alvin Kamara. Okay? And obviously, you just look at some of the things that they were doing. And ultimately, him taking a 21-20 to lead, overcoming a 17-point deficit. And then for the Vikings to turn around and to kick a field goal. And to give themselves a 23-21 to lead. But Drew Brees still had a minute and 25 seconds left. And that fourth and 10 play, when he hit Willie Sneed on the sideline, and I just said, it's Drew Brees we're talking about here. It's Drew Brees. Don't you worry about a thing. I tweeted and everything. I said it's a tough one, but it's plenty of time, and I believe in Brees. I believe in Brees. And sure enough, he got him in a field goal range, 53-yard field goal. 
connected. Saints have the lead. They're up one. Defense just got to neutralize Case Keenum. And the next thing you know, with 10 seconds left, pretty much the last play of the game, all you got to do is let Stephon Diggs catch the ball and keep him in bounds. Make sure that he doesn't go out of bounds. That's all you had to do. Nothing else. You didn't have to block the pass. You didn't have to make sure it was incomplete. You didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to, all you had to do was let him catch the pass and tackle him in bounds. That's it. Nothing else. And this rookie, Marcus Williams, is coming on too fast. He doesn't want to get called for a pass interference because that'll leave time on the clock. It'll give the Vikings extra yardage. yardage. It would make a field go that easier. And as a result, they would lose. So we understand what he was dealing with. But he came on too fast. And as a result, felt the need to move out the way. And so what he did was he dived a a little bit away from Stephon Diggs, basically in an attempt to undercut him if indeed he did catch the ball. And as a result, he ended up missing him altogether. Stephon Diggs adroitly makes the catch, keeps himself in bounds, and scampers down the sideline for a 62, 61-yard touchdown play from Case Keenum as time expired to deliver the Minnesota Vikings the victory. And I must confess to you, I wanted to throw up. And by the way, one of the reasons was that damn NFL, a National Football League, and those suits in the league office who need to loosen it up, take their belts, loosen it up, their jackets, loosen up, get a life. Why the hell should the Saints have to come out for an extra point after a moment like that? The crowd is is sheer pandemonium. The players are celebrating. The moment is not something you teach, nor is it something you can buy. But because the NFL is tight as Lord knows what, don't know how to relax at all. You're gonna let you're gonna make the Saints come back out, so you can take an extra snap, and the game could be over. Just the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Just the pride Vikings fans, even more so at the moment they could have had, even though it was a good moment. This makes no sense whatsoever. But that's what transpired. But the biggest thing for me, what really made me sick to my stomach, is the fact that Drew Brees is not going to be in the Super Bowl. Because, ladies and gentlemen, without him in the Super Bowl, you know what I have as a choice out of the NFC? Case Keenum or Nick Foles. Really? I mean, really? Why why don't y'all just ask people to skip the Super Bowl? I mean... Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if anybody's realized this, but you talk about Tom Brady holding the NFL in the palm of his hands. Could you imagine if the Super Bowl is Blake Bortles versus Nick Foles or Case Keenum? You talk, you talk about ratings plummeting. Not to mention the fact that Jacksonville's defense is elite. Phillies is damn near that way, and Minnesota's number one. So could you imagine... What the Super Bowl, we can anticipate for the Super Bowl. It might go down as the most boring Super Bowl in history. Unless Tom Brady's in it. In case no one has thought about it, perhaps you should think about that now. 888-729-3776. It's 888-SAY-ESPN. That's why I was so depressed that New Orleans lost. I'm depressed about the Steelers for a different reason. Mike Mitchell opening his mouth. Le'Veon Bell opening his mouth. Them talking about everything but the Jacksonville Jaguars, that didn't help. And then talking about a defense that went out there and went to bed. I understand that Ben Roethlisberger threw an interception. I understand that ultimately he had a sack, you know, sack fumble that was returned for a touchdown. I get all of that. He gave him 14 points. I understand. Really, seven. Because just because you threw an interception doesn't mean that the Steelers couldn't have stopped Leonard Fournette, which they couldn't, by the way. 82 yards and three touchdowns in the first half. If he hadn't hurt his ankle, Lord knows how many yardage he would have, how much yardage he would have had for the game. We can debate Mike Tomlin and that onside kick call. We can talk about Ben Roethlisberger and the turnovers. We can talk about Tomlin and his future in Pittsburgh for all I can. We can talk about all of that. But I tell you what you need to talk about. You need to talk about the heyday of this 
steel curtain. And how that's been long gone. This defense intimidates nobody. This defense phases no one. And yesterday, it was more apparent than ever before. Blake Bortles' offense put up 38 of Jacksonville's 45 points. Blake Bortles. That's what the Steelers have to deal with this entire offseason. They gave up 38 points to Blake Bortles. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. 888-729-3776. 888-SAY-ESPN. Straight talk, wireless nationwide coverage on America's most dependable 4G LTE networks. We'll continue talking on the Stephen A. Smith Show. We'll get into Atlanta losing to the Philadelphia Eagles. We'll talk more about New Orleans, Minnesota. We'll talk about Pittsburgh, Jacksonville. And we'll talk about how Tom Brady, more than ever before, is in position to be a savior for the National Football League. That and so much more coming up as the show progresses today. You are listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Back to football. Pittsburgh Steelers lose this game yesterday. And there's a lot of things that you can point to without question. Ben Roethlisberger had two turnovers. But damn, he threw for 469 yards and five touchdowns. Um, It's hard to hold him primarily accountable for what transpired yesterday. If the Steelers had a defense, it wouldn't have came to this point. Um, But their defense was highly suspect. Uh, With under two minutes remaining, a little over two minutes remaining, and Mike Tomlin in position uh, to kick the football off, he decided uh, on an onside kick. And he's taking major, major, major heat for that. In my opinion, I agree it was the wrong call. I would not have done it. But I can understand why he did it. It was 2.18 left in the game. Pittsburgh went for an onside kick after cutting the deficit to 42-35. to Despite possessing two timeouts with the two-minute warning ahead. But Mike Tomlin didn't believe in that defense. And the reality is, who the hell should? I mean, the Pittsburgh Steelers look so pathetic at times, they couldn't stop me. Now, obviously, you can't take anything away from Jacksonville. Leonard Fournette is a stud. I mean, he wasn't getting touched for the first three or four yards. He ran the football. And the minute he got touched, he dragged dudes with him some extra yardage. If he hadn't gotten hurt, I think Leonard Fournette would have had a hundred, another 180-yard-plus game. I really do. He was that powerful. He was that punishing for the Pittsburgh Steelers. But Blake Bortles was impressive in the fourth quarter as well. He went through one stretch. He's five or six for 120 yards. Threw a 45-yard pass to Keelan Cole, setting up a touchdown that gave them a cushion after the Steelers were marching back. You know, play action fake, threw a 14-yard touchdown pass to a, a, a fullback in Bohannon. Offsetting spectacular touchdown catches by Antonio Brown, who, by the way, whose cast was not 100%, but he still had over 120 receiving yards. Martavis Bryant, that catch that he had for a touchdown to end the first half, that was impressive too. But in the end, what it comes down to is this. Ben Roethlisberger made mistakes. But Ben Roethlisberger balled. Antonio Brown balled. Le'Veon Bell, even though he shouldn't have been talking about his damn contract heading into the game, he still backed it up. He balled. Look at his yard from scrimmage. It's the Steelers' defense that didn't show up. You look at Keith Butler, I don't know what the hell's going on. Todd Haley with some of his play calling earlier on trying to run a sweep against the speed of Jacksonville's defense, which, by the way, they saw it coming from a mile away. I don't know why the hell you would call that play. So there's a lot of blame to go around. Nobody's trying to absolve Mike Tomlin. He's the man. He's the head coach. Damn it, it's on him. Some of that play calling was on him. If you could have control over Ben Roethlisberger near the end of the regular season when y'all played New England, throwing an interception because he wanted to spike the ball and y'all wanted him to run a play, and he ended up throwing the interception. If Mike Tomlin could have something to do with that play calling, he's got something to do with some of the other play calling that took place. I love the guy, but I am worried for him because you got a lot of people that are looking at Mike Tomlin right now wondering what the hell is going on.
When you got players talking out of pocket that way, that wouldn't happen with New England. Braggadocio being worn on their chest. That wouldn't happen with, with Bill Belichick. Hell, it wouldn't happen with Mike McCarthy. So these are the kind of things that you got to look at. Todd Haley's probably going to be gone. But they did put up some points, so it ain't all on them either. But this defense, I am sick of the Steelers' defense. No pass rush worth speaking of. Barely any pressure. And on top of it all, don't get me started with that secondary. Which is why I'm discussing that Mike Mitchell would be all emboldened by anything. I like him. He can play. He's not a scrub. But I'm, I am I mean, come on. Blake Bortles dropped 38. 38. If you're the New York Giants, by the way, how are you feeling about Mike Tomlin doing the job that he's done? Mike Tomlin probably deserved to be removed as head coach of the New York Giants, but maybe you should have moved him upstairs and gave him Jerry Reese's job instead of casting him out. Maybe that's what you should have done. Because looking at this Jacksonville squad right now, let me tell you something. They're going to give the Patriots hell. Remember, Jacksonville doesn't have to blitz in order to get at Brady. They can rush four, drop seven back into the secondary, and still do damage. You want to see what Brady's kryptonite is? There you have it. Blitzing Grady, Brady ain't gonna, ain't gonna rattle him. Set in the house ain't gonna rattle him. But if you're able to apply pressure while nobody downfield is open, now you got yourself a problem. Speaking of all of those folks, always lamenting New England, Spygate, Deflategate, and beyond. They've been to seven straight conference finals now. All I got to say is this. If Bill Belichick's cheating, here's my question. How come the rest of y'all haven't learned how to cheat like him? Can't beat him, join him. I'd have figured that by now. I'd have figured that out by now. But that's just me. 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. I'll get back to your calls in a minute. I'll get to your calls in a little bit, but not before I get to my man Ryan Clark, NFL analyst extraordinaire for ESPN. He's up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Always my honor and privilege to have my next guest on the line, former Super Bowl champion with the Pittsburgh Steelers, who's got a lot of explaining to do today. He really, really does. I'm talking about the one and only Ryan Clark, NFL analyst extraordinaire for ESPN. What's going on, man? How you doing? Hey, man, I'm just trying to get over the loss from yesterday, man. I see that you're not taking it well. I'm not taking it well at all, but we'll get into that in just a few minutes. The play of the day obviously occurred in Minnesota. Talk to us about your, what you saw from your vantage point about what happened with Marcus Williams, the rookie, making what I, I can't even classify it as a rookie mistake. I, I can't believe it. It happened to anybody. But explain to us what happened and what was your reaction when you saw that play that ultimately led to Minnesota escaping with this divisional playoff victory? <laughs> you know, Stephen, I'll be honest with you, I had chills. Um, watching the play because that type of excitement, that type of unpredictability is why we watch the game, why we watch it until the end. But when you're Marcus Williams, you know the call. They're in a cover two call, boundary call, where you're not going to let a guy catch the ball and get out of bounds and have an opportunity to kick a field goal. And I felt like he tried to play it that way. He got there a little early and – what happened at that point when he tried to make the tackle is unexplainable for me, and only Marcus can really answer that, but it's, it's, it's inexcusable. Um, you can't do that whether you're a rookie or whether you're a veteran. And I think the play by Stephon Diggs, though, to not go out of bounds, to have the wherewithal to stay in bounds, get upfield, and score the touchdown was amazing. And to me, this really puts Minnesota in the, driving, the driver's seat to represent the NFC in the Super Bowl. Uh, a play like that, when you're the, when you're on the same sideline, you think you've won the game. When you're Everson Griffin and the rest of those Minnesota Vikings, you think this is a last ditch effort to just continue playing, not thinking that you'll actually score a touchdown. So to have that play happen um, is something that will be remembered by not only the people watching, 
but especially the guys playing the game. I asked this question, and I'm shocked that I didn't see anyone on the air asking this question to guys uh, throughout the football world after in the aftermath of this victory last night by Minnesota. If you were a teammate, a member of New Orleans defense, a member of New Orleans period, what would your reaction be when you walked into that locker room uh, after a mistake like that by one of your teammates? Well, you know, I think it depends on on which Ryan Clark you're talking about. If you're talking about the young Ryan Clark who was still trying to find his way, I'd probably be more concerned about what I didn't do correctly uh, throughout the game that even led to that play. Um, but as a veteran, and, you know, and I've, ha- I've never had a play like that, but you've had plays um, to cost you games. Shoot, I've had plays to cost my team's. Um, games like you don't try to do that like you don't go out and say you know what I want to miss this tackle or I want to overrun this play or I want to duck my head and not make this play uh, I was asked about it on Twitter last night and I say the first thing you tell them is hey Rook you had a great year you're going to be an excellent player and you're going to have many more opportunities to make plays like this be accountable take responsibility commend the Minnesota Vikings I love you Let's get on the bus and go home. And, and and that's how he has to approach it. That's how you have to approach it as a veteran. You heard Cam Jordan say last night, I think about all the plays I could have made. As a player of my caliber, it shouldn't have gotten to that point. And Cam Jordan is taking the right veteran approach to losing that game. I, I tell you, somebody else who's taking the right approach is another rookie, Mr. Lattimore. It's Marshawn Lattimore, uh, because he basically said the same thing. He said the kid's a great kid. Uh, he's got a lot of talent, a tremendous upside. He was a second-round pick. He's in the start lineup for us. He said, you know what, you just can't let it get it down. It was a devastating play, uh, but he's got a bright future ahead of him. I thought that was the right attitude for him to take, but I tell you this much, I feel sorry for Drew Brees because at his age, in this game, with the greatness that he's put on display, particularly in the second half of last night's game, he's got to be wondering how many more opportunities is he going to have in his career. Absolutely. I mean, if you listen to him talk post-game, uh, it definitely sounded like he was very aware of that. Uh, he was very aware that there's not many teams you think have the capability of reaching this point. And for the last three years, he hasn't had a defense that would even give him this opportunity. So to be in this position – and not only be in this position as your team is constructed, but to be in that position in the game where you should have won the game and lose, and you know you have a Philadelphia team that is a little bit down without Carson Wentz. I mean, this is an opportunity uh, that, that you're going to regret missing if you're Drew Brees. Because like you said, Stephen, at, at turning 39 soon, how many more opportunities would Drew Brees have uh, to be in this position? Ryan Clark right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Let's get to your former team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Tell me what happened to them. I'm looking at this team right now. My disgust is – is I, I just can't even ex- explain it. On, on one hand, Mike Mitchell opening his mouth. Yes, he was alluding as he tweeted to the interview that, it, that had taken place weeks ago about Chazier when he was talking about the New England Patriots. He wasn't looking past the Jacksonville Jaguars fair enough, but he sent the tweet in response to my diatribe against him. Uh, but he didn't send one to Teddy Bruschi or yourself or others who lamented <laughs> him open his mouth, you know, about uh, before you played the Jacksonville Jaguars. Then the defense goes out. Yes, Ben Roethlisberger, a fumble recovery that was taken in for a touchdown but outside of that Blake Bortles and that Jacksonville offense put up 38 points on this Steelers defense what do you make of that Ryan Clark that the Steelers have to be better I mean uh you know for years I, I've been coming on the show and, and and talking to you here on the radio and we talked about the defense not producing uh that was a prime opportunity to to show up for your team Ben Roethlisberger put up 42 points on the Jacksonville Jaguars a top two defense uh, in the NFL, and you can't stop the Jacksonville Jaguars enough to win. There was a point where they were down seven in the fourth quarter, and they allowed Blake Bortles to engineer two touchdown drives. Those were the plays that the Pittsburgh Steelers needed to make on defense. And uh, you don't know if I don't know if it's personnel, I don't know if it's play calling. Obviously, the the, the loss of Shazier looms very large on his defense, but. To have those things happen, they're, they're unexplainable, inexplicable, and uh, you can't excuse those. And so as a defense, they have to get better, and they let the team down. 
uh, when it comes to those clutch moments in the fourth quarter. How did that happen, though? Because you're hearing guys didn't trust that guys would be in there so you do their assignments, cover the gaps and what have you. The team just seemed a bit discombobulated. Le'Veon Bell commenting about his contract coming into the game. Uh, Mike Mitchell talking about what they were going to do to the Jaguars the morning of the game. What do you? And then you look at Tomlin, obviously the onside kick or whatever. Or more importantly, these guys' willingness to sound off, knowing that you put yourself in a precarious circumstances, and that's something that Mike Tomlin wouldn't like yet it still happened what's going on with your former team I think I think Mike T can't necessarily not like these guys talking about these things when for the first time ever since I remember him he spoke about the future he spoke about facing the Patriots twice he spoke about having to play them in a regular season and then meeting them again in the playoffs so as a team if, if Mike T's coming out and saying these things out loud I'm pretty sure these are things that are being discussed in the building. And I think the team kind of followed suit with that. On the other side, whether it's Mike Mitchell, Le'Veon Bell, or whoever speaks out, Mike T gives people the opportunity to be themselves, to be individuals, to be uh, their their, their own brand, per se. And so this is kind of what comes with the territory. It's not that New England Patriots, New England Patriots, we're going to do everything this way and the way Bill Belichick does it. It's not really how it works mm-hmm. in Pittsburgh. Should um, we be – should we – go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just don't necessarily know how much that plays into your preparation for the game. How concerned, if at all, should any of us be about Mike Thomas' future in Pittsburgh in light of the fact that, you know, a loss like this, you got a lot of people looking at him, particularly yeah. after that onside kick. How How concerned should he be? I don't, I don't. I don't think he should be concerned in the sense that I think he's built up a rapport and a, a relationship with the Steelers organization to where he'll be all right. Uh, but I'm concerned, and Why? you know, I know, I know, I know. Many times you and I get a little flack for how we deal with the quote unquote black topics. Yep. Right. Uh, but if you listen to um, just the people outside of us, right? Mm-hmm. When when Mike Tomlin is spoken about spoken about. When has he ever spoken of as a, a great X's and O's coach? When has he ever spoken about as a great decision maker? It's always uh, his personality, his charisma, his, his uh, ability to, to lead, the way that he presents himself. But it's never about what he does on the headset. And I think when you have a game like this, when people already try to point out that you're not necessarily a great decision maker – I think that feeds into that narrative. And so for me, I am nervous for him in the sense of when does it all come to a head and when does the outside noise get cloudy enough or loud enough that they start paying attention to some of these losses and some of these downfalls to inferior teams and say, you know what, even though we win 12, 13 games, maybe Mike T shouldn't be our coach anymore. Mm. Ryan Clark right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Look, before I let you get on out of here, a couple more questions. I considered New England having a bye week because I knew what they were going to do to Tennessee, and sure enough, it happened. And now Malarkey is out as the coach. Good riddance. He was 20 and 21 in two and a half seasons coaching the team. I mean, he didn't do an awful job, but it ain't like they, it ain't like he was a, a game changer. You know what? You can get right. another coach that could do that. But uh, transitioning to the NFC, the Philadelphia Eagles, Atlanta Falcons, I, I, I put that that on Matt Ryan, yes, this Philadelphia Eagles defense deserves a boatload of credit. But you're the reigning league MVP with the same personnel, Sanu, Julio mm-hmm. Jones, Tevin Coleman, Devontae Freeman, and the boys. You have got to be able to put up more than 10 points on the defense if you're Matt no, Ryan. I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, as a defense, you give up 15 points, points to the Philadelphia Eagles. You hold in the red zone on a couple of occasions to give your team an opportunity to, to, to win. You have Matt Ryan, like you say, Julio Jones, Muhammad Sanu, Taylor Gabriel, Freeman, Coleman. I mean, all of these weapons, and you only score 10 points. You don't put up any points in the second half. And this is not this is not new for the Atlanta Falcons. The defense carried them down the stretch. It wasn't the offense making the plays that we saw them make last year that got them to this point. And when you look at that second half of that game, obviously, like you said, you give Philadelphia credit, but it was – Matt Ryan's inability to create the big play that hampered this team all year. I think that actually bit them in the butt in this playoff game against the Eagles, which is why the Eagles are moving on and the Falcons season is over. Who do you have winning the AFC championship game between New England and Jacksonville? 
Uh, I, I believe New England wins it, but it's not going to be what people think. The Jacksonville Jaguars are made to play defense against the New England Patriots. And I'm interested to in see if Jalen Ramsey matches up on the outside when Gronkowski is split out. I think defensively they're going to give New England all they want. Uh, I'm just scared that Blake Bortles won't be able to make the plays he made against Pittsburgh or against Bill Belichick, Matt Patricia, and that defense in New England. Philadelphia, Minnesota, in Philly, Sunday night. Who you going with? Minnesota. Minnesota is going to be the first team ever to host a Super Bowl and play in it. Ryan Clark, I'm going with Philadelphia. I well, think Philadelphia be will wrong. beat Minnesota at home. You'll be wrong, and we'll talk about it on Monday. There you go. Don't worry about it, though. <laughs> I'm not hiding. You better not hide either, because I couldn't find I you for a couple do, of brother. months with the Steelers. I couldn't find <laughs> you for a few months. Appreciate you, bro. Thanks so much. Yes, sir, always. Take it easy, no doubt. Ryan Clark right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio, 888-729-3776. It's 888-SAY-ESPN. You can catch him on NFL Live this afternoon, by the way. He's always doing his thing on that show. Uh Definitely, you can continue to catch me right here. We still got a lot more to talk about in terms of this NFL playoff week, and I'm still disgusted. I'm still so disgusted. Damn Steelers. And, of course, Minnesota being the luckiest team alive, for crying out loud. I wanted to see Drew Brees in the Super Bowl. I want to see a quarterback. Now I got Case Keenum or Nick Foles. What is this? Ah. Back with more in a minute of the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Got a lot of phone calls to get into in hour number two because we'll get more into these NFL playoffs. Thanks again to Ryan Clark for coming on the show. We'll continue talking about these playoff games that took place over the weekend, the playoff games that are ensuing. Jacksonville visits Foxborough against New England for the AFC Championship game at 3 o'clock on Sunday. A 6.30 game is uh, the Philadelphia Eagles hosting the Minnesota Vikings for the NFC Championship game. When a winner ending up in Minnesota for the Super Bowl, Minnesota's got a chance to be the first home team at a, uh, you know, to have a Super Bowl, basically hosting the Super Bowl. That's what it is. So it'll be real interesting to get into all of that. Of course, we won't avoid doing so at all. Lots of stuff to get into, plus Magic Johnson coming in the support of Luke Walton. The Cleveland Cavaliers are hosting the Golden State Warriors tonight. Rematch of the NBA Finals. We got to get into all of that as well. And I'll tell you why I think tonight's game for Cleveland isn't just a regular season game, or at least it should not be just another regular season game. It should be far more important than that. No question about it. That's the kind of stuff that we'll get into as the show progresses towards hour number two. And again, we'll go to your calls at 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. This is the Stephen A. Smith Show coming at you live on a holiday for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the greatest civil rights leader we have ever known as far as I'm concerned. Hour number two up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. That was the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. One of his many speeches, one of his, one of his many great phenomenal speeches. Uh, you're listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Number to call up as always is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. Uh, it's Dr. Martin Luther King holidays. It's his birthday. And uh, on a day like today, federal holiday, we want to take a moment to pay to pay homage to this great man, greatest civil rights leader I've ever known. And um, and that is the case for most of us as well, by the way. Uh, so <clears throat> you'll be hearing excerpts from some of his great speeches throughout the show today, as has been the case for the first hour of the show. Again, you're listening live to Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. 888-SAY-ESPN is the number called. That's 888-729-3776. No matter what the weather is outside, you can always brighten the day with 1-800-Flowers.com. When you order a dozen multicolored roses for only twenty nine ninety nine, you'll get another dozen absolutely free. Just go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. Going back to the discussion about the playoffs and about the Pittsburgh Steelers in particular. I want to say a couple of things. Number one, Mike Tomlin, Keith Butler, defensive coordinator, and others did not do a great job. Matter of fact, it was a relatively poor job. It's undeniable uh, because it's not just about what transpired on the field. It's also what transpired in guys in terms of guys running their mouths. Mike Mitch, free safety for the Pittsburgh Steelers, ran his mouth 
uh, on it was publicized for running his mouth on far too many occasions. Uh, he got on me on Twitter, essentially saying that he expected me to know the facts journalistically because the quote that everybody was lending itself, uh, lending, uh, lending towards him rather, was a quote that he gave to a reporter weeks earlier asking about Ryan Chazier. Uh, fair enough, if that is the truth. Uh, but from my understanding, those was, those weren't the only quotes that he attributed uh, towards looking forward to playing New England and ultimately looking past Jacksonville. And that's what I got on him about. Not to mention the fact that Teddy Bruschi, Ryan Clark, and others got on him for opening his mouth. He didn't send any tweets towards them. They're Super Bowl champions. And they were looking at a guy and saying, what the hell are you doing? And that's all I said. But he is a damn good player, even though he got raked through the coals by Rob Gronkowski a few weeks ago. But that's neither here nor there. Here's the bottom line. The Steelers defense got shredded by Blake Borders yesterday. And apparently myself, Teddy Bruschi and Ryan Clark weren't the only ones who took offense to um, Mike Mitchell opening his mouth, along with Le'Veon Bell opening his mouth. Steelers guard David DeCastro says he's not happy. This is according to Ed Boucher for the Pittsburgh Post Courier. David DeCastro not happy with a few teammates disrespecting Jaguars. Quote, it's embarrassing. It really is. It just blows my mind. They beat us 30 to 9. We played like crap. And we want to talk about New England? More De- no more Steelers DeCastro and teammates talking Patriots before they played the Jags. It's just stupid. It's just not what you do. You don't need to give a team like that more bulletin board material. But not only were did they take those comments that way, did a teammate like Mike Mitchell take those comments that way? Look at who else took the comments that way. The Jacksonville Jaguars in the aftermath of beating the Pittsburgh Steelers yesterday. These are the tweets put out by various members of the Jaguars. Will Graves gets a report. He's got a Will Graves for AP, the Associated Press. This is a this is a quote that he tweeted from Jalen Ramsey. I was wondering why they were so confident because we stomped their ass last time. We knew he was going to do the same thing this time. We were confident coming into the game. I can't tell you why they were so confident, but that went out the door real quick. Barry Church, according to Will Graves, all we did was feed on a few that everybody was providing. The media, everybody was talking about how they're going to run through us. It's not going to be like last week. Blake Bortles this, Blake Bortles that. All he did was dominate their defense. J.P. Shadrick quotes Jalen Ramsey. They asked for us and they got us. Let's keep it real. We should have blown them out. Rick Walsh. I think it's KDKA. I think it's a television station. Jacksonville players outside their locker room yelling, where's Mike Mitchell? I want to see Mike Mitchell right now. Dan Graciano for ESPN. Black Jaguar players could be heard in the hall shouting, where's Mitchell? Bring Mike Mitchell out here. Tim Benz, some guy named Tim Benz, Jackson on Ball's tweet, Bell's tweet rather, Le'Veon Bell, because remember he was talking about them too. They said they were going to be in Boston, so I guess they're going to be in Boston watching us. We'll send them Jags jerseys so they can support us. More Tim Benz, Calais Campbell on the Steelers. Hey, look, they're a great team. And, and then Marcel Darius jumps in and said, stop saying they are a great team. They just got their ass whooped. Am I inaccurate now, Mike Mitchell? Not by respect for you, your game. But you didn't show up last night, yesterday afternoon. Neither did the rest of the Steelers' defense. Y'all gave up 38 points to Blake Bortles. I'm going to say it again. 38 points to Blake Bortles. 38 points to Blake Bortles. And Blake Bortles had a good fourth quarter, five or six for 120 yards during one stretch. Blake Bortles showed up. He shows up like that against New England. Jacksonville can win this AFC championship game because against New England, Tom Brady, you want to know his kryptonite? Send four rushes. Don't blitz. Send four to apply the pressure. Drop the other seven in coverage. With that speed, that athleticism, and the hit man that they've got in their secondary, I got news for you. Jacksonville can make Sunday nightmarish for Tom Brady and the New England Patriots if the Patriots ain't careful. Here's the difference. The mistakes that Mike Tomlin and his staff made through this game, chances are Bill Belichick, Matt Patricia, and the crew ain't going to do that. They're going to dot every I, they're going to cross every T, and they're not going to underestimate anybody. As Teddy Bruschi came on, on first take, Last week, my show on ESPN every weekday from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern time, when he came on a show and said last week, he said, 
Bill Belichick encourages his team, spray the perfume. Say nothing but sweet things to your opponent and about your opponent all week long. Provide no bulletin board material whatsoever. So guess what? In other words, Bill Belichick ain't going to have any members of his Patriot squad imitating Mike Mitchell, Le'Veon Bell, or anybody else on the Steelers who were talking smack. Looking past the Jaguars, clearly, because they wanted a second shot at the Patriots. He's not going to have that. That's why he's been to seven consecutive AFC championship games. That's why he has two Super Bowl championships in the last four years or so. Just a thought. Just a thought. Marty in New York, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, hey, Stephen A. Long time, no, a uh, long time caller. Uh, Thank listener, you. First time caller. Thank you. I am a Steelers fan. Mm-hmm. My God, my defense. A high school team could play better defense than the Steelers yesterday against Blake Bortles and everything. You know what I'm saying? Mike Mitchell needs to shut his damn mouth and play defense yesterday. And another thing I have a great with is those two fourth and inches calls where we did the sweep outside knowing Jacksonville's defense was so damn fast on the outside. We couldn't get there. We lost four yards. And then another one was that pass. How can we bring out Ben Lossberg is 6'5"? He could have just leaned forward and scored. I mean, got those first downs. Granted, he threw the ball on some beautiful passes to Antonio Brown and them on fourth downs and stuff. But our defense looks so horrible. I agree with you about the Steelers Curtains a long time ago. And Le'Veon Bell should have shut up about his contract while franchise tagging him and shown up. He did his thing, too. But our defense well, no, 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 wait, wait, so wait, wait, bad. Le'Veon Bell did show up. He balled. Mike Mitchell may not have, but Le'Veon did ball. Let's not, let's not knock Le'Veon. I mean, listen, he, you know, he talked a little smack or whatever about his contract, but he did show you why he's validated. He did show you why he deserves his money. He, Antonio Brown, and Big Ben, the big three showed up yesterday. They were not flawless, especially Big Ben with his two mistakes that cost him basically 14 points, but the offense showed up. This game was on the defense and the coaching. I don't think there's any question about that. I appreciate the call. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. More of the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio in a minute. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Back to Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. 888-729-3776. It's 888-SAY-ESPN. Stephen A. Smith Show live with you. Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday. Again, 888-SAY-ESPN is the number to call up. Stephen A. Smith Show is being brought to you by Penzoil Synthetics, talking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole, taking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole new level. Make the switch to Penzoil Synthetics today. Let's go over to the phones. Carlton in Tampa, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, buddy. Where do I start today, my friend? First off, Mike Mitchell is hot garbage. In 14 games this year, he's gotten his hands on two balls, Stephen A. He has two passes defended in 14 games. No interceptions. He... He's not even in the frame of reference usually when there's double coverage and he's, he's over the top. Okay. He, he's awful. He is truly awful. And until the Steelers get rid of him, they're going nowhere. Okay. Secondly, I got a prediction for you, Stephen A. Uh-oh. This coming, this coming go- Sunday. No, no, let me guess. Let me guess. You're going to pick the Jacksonville Jaguars to beat the New England Patriots, aren't you? No. No, I'm going to okay. predict that Ramsey and Boye are going to get at least three defensive holding or pass interference calls on the New England Patriots. They mauled the Steelers re- uh, receivers yesterday. And the, and the refs did not take the flag out of their pocket one time. How about when Ra- Ramsey goes over the top of Martavius Bryant at the five-yard line? Mauls him. No flag comes out. I, agree with I that. guarantee you the refs are going to throw multiple flags flags on them for the New England Patriots because it looks like the refs have decided that the Patriots are going to be the Super Bowl champions. In the last four games, Stephen A., last four games, since the Patriots got in trouble when they lost unexpectedly to the Dolphins, the refs have called all of 12 penalties for 100 yards against the New England Patriots. They have called 29 penalties for 292 yards against our opponents, reversed two of their opponents' touchdowns called on the field, reversed a fourth down opponent's stop on the field and gave the ball back to the Patriots, and reversed a Patriots' fourth down punt against Tennessee and gave the Patriots the ball back. 
It is unbelievable, Stephen A. And even Tony Romo and Jim Nance and Mike Malarkey, they all see it in the first half of last of last uh, 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 weekend's game against the Titans, and nobody else sees it. The refs are calling three times the amount of penalties on the opposition. It's on the basis. But, 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 but wait a minute, wait a minute. You're giving me numbers and you're giving me stats, and I can't respect that. But I got a I got a loaded question to ask you, Carlton. Go is ahead. it is it possible that Bill Belichick? knows the rules better than most of his opponents and as no. a result hold on and as a result coaches his players to to sit up there and know the rules themselves and know how to draw these penalties against the opposition oh they they know the rules better in the first 13 games of this season uh, Stephen A the Patriots had 87 penalties for 772 yards their opponents had 92 penalties only five more for 805 yards 34 yards more So they were within like 4% of each other for the first 13 games. And in the last four games, when the Patriots were looking like they weren't going to get home field advantage, they have called three times, 300% of the amount of penalties on the opponents is on the Patriots and reversed two of their touchdowns. And like I say, reversed the fourth down stop of them, reversed the fourth down punt of the Patriots. It's a joke, Stephen A. And and Tony Romo saw what a joke it was. And that game should have... Here's my problem with what you're saying. You're acting like the Patriots are going to win the Super Bowl by default when, in fact, again, I've, and I've said this to you on many occasions, Carlton, if Bill Belichick cheats so much, if Bill Belichick gets so much favor and what have you, when does it come a point in time when the opponents are culpable in terms of getting themselves in that, into a similar position? If you can't beat him, join him. Figure out a way to do what the hell he's doing. Answer that no, quickly no, because I got to answer that rules, quickly. Stephen A. Answer, if, if, listen, if everything falls into wide open oh, 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 lawlessness, oh, oh, nobody's going to want to watch the game. I, all right, Carlton. I got to run. But, but I, now I'm saying that right, the refs and the league wants the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Oh, you're they damn right. They do. And, you're damn, and you should, too. And you should, too. Why the hell would you want to see Blake Bortles versus Nick Foles or Case Keenum? Why would you want to see that? If I want to see the, I want to see Tom Brady. Beat the Patriots and well, get the game taken away. Hey, 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 I don't hey, want to hey, see hey, the next season. Hey, 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 as far as I'm concerned, it looks legit, it looks legitimate to me. I ain't got no problems with it, Carlton. But I appreciate the call. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carlton. See, Carlton's going to hate on the Patriots no matter what. I mean, they're five-time champions. They've been in seven straight AFC championship games. I mean, come on. The worst record they've had since the new millennial is nine and seven. And Carlton will find a way. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's no legitimacy. Spygate, Deflategate, we get all of that. We understand the impetus for his ire. We get it. But I mean, my God, at some point in time, what, Bill Belichick's cheating? That's your answer to everything? Or Bill Belichick's the only one cheating? That's your answer to everything? No, Carlton. He's better than everybody else. He's better. He knows every trick. He knows every rule. He knows how to get to, he knows how to go right up to that line without touching that third rail. Most times anyway. That's just the way it is. We can act like we don't know, but it's the truth. Ain't no getting around it. Steven in Ohio, talk to me. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steven. Go ahead, buddy. Yeah, man, I'll tell you what, Carl, you gotta, you gotta stand back, back when, just like you stood back and watched the great, Iron Curtain, you know, you you just like wow, that was, what a great team, you know, what great players, yeah. You know, and Belichick, I, I I like Belichick. I liked him when he was with the Browns. I like what he did with the Browns, and when he went to the Patriots, I, I followed. Him. And he's good. He's a good coach, and I love the he's way great. he runs that, he's that great. locker room. He's great. Belichick he's, is yeah. the best. He's the standard. Period. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I love, I, I love, like I said, what he does with that locker room. That locker room. Do you hear much coming out of that locker room? Here's the bottom line. Here's what you're trying to say, Stephen. Okay. Mike Mitchell, Le'Veon Bell, their comments would have never been made if they were playing for the Patriots. That's basically what you're trying to say. Yeah. And, and there's nobody can never refute that right now. I wish I could, but I can't. I really, really do, Stephen, but I can't. You're absolutely right. That's something that Mike Tomlin's got to reel in. You know, he is emotional. He is chest thumping, but I happen to think he's a damn good coach. His record during the first half of a season, it's usually better during the second half of the season. Seven of the ten seasons he's been a coach, guess what? Uh, you know, and now 11, his record in the second half of the season has been better than his record in the first half. But you can't lose games like you lost yesterday. And you can't lose games the way you lost yesterday. There is no way around that. We can slice it any way we want to. But it is what it is. Period. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Stephen A. Smith showing over 250 markets plus across the country, plus Sirius XM. You'll continue to hear us, even though in New York you might be hearing some of, something about the Knicks. Stick around. It's Stephen A. Smith Show. ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Stephen A. Smith Show right here with you on ESPN Radio. More excerpts from great speeches by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This is his holiday. Uh, so obviously that's why you're hearing from the greatest civil rights leader, as far as I'm concerned, ever. Number to call up as always is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance with insurance for cars, home, boat, motorcycles, RVs, and commercial vehicles at 1-800-PROGRESSIVE and Progressive.com. Before I get back to the calls about these playoff NFL playoff weekend, uh, in which Blake Bortles and uh, Jacksonville Jaguars scored 30, 45 points against the Pittsburgh Steelers, winning their AFC divisional playoff game. They're set to meet the New England Patriots in the AFC championship game. Of course, a miracle in Minneapolis. Uh, as uh, the Minnesota Vikings lucked up because a rookie by the name of Marcus Williams forgot that he's supposed to be a safety, he's supposed to be the last line of defense, and you're not supposed to dive head first and not touch a receiver, you know, and let him scamper down the sideline for 61 yards for a touchdown. He'll have to live with that for the rest of his career. Uh, that's something that we've been talking about and we will continue to talk about. But we also need to talk a little bit about tonight's game at Quicken's Loans Arena in Cleveland, Ohio. The Cleveland Cavaliers are getting set to host the Golden State Warriors, the reigning defending NBA champions who beat Cleveland in the finals. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at the Golden State Warriors. Steph Curry returned Saturday night, 127-125 thriller at Toronto. Um, DeRozan dropped 42 points. He's really, really improved his shooting, even though he shot all four from three-point range. Uh, he hit 17 of 31 shots, finished with 42, uh, but it still wasn't enough to beat the Golden State Warriors, Clay Thompson, he dropped 26. Kevin Durant had 25. Steph Curry dropped 24. Only took 12 shots, hit 6 of 12 from the field, 2 of 7 from three-point range. In the end, what it comes down to is that um, the Golden State Warriors, it's something that they're doing that I haven't paid attention to. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand that their record is 35-9, and nine, Okay. Do y'all know that the Golden State Warriors haven't lost two straight all season long? And think about this. They lose the opener to Houston. They beat New Orleans. They lose the third game of the season to the Grizzlies. They win three straight. They lose to the Pistons. Okay? They lose to the Pistons. And then the next thing you know, they go from four and three on the season to 11 and three. They win seven straight. They lose to the Celtics. They win two straight. They lose to Oklahoma City. They win two straight. They lose to Sacramento. Okay? And when they lost to Sacramento, their record was 15 and 6. The next thing you know, they're 26 and 6. They win 11 straight. I mean, this is what they do. They lose to Denver. They, they, they win two straight against Cleveland and Utah. They lose to Charlotte. And what do they do? They win five straight. They lose to the Clippers the other night. They win two straight. And they lost to the Clippers, by the way, when they gave up 50 to Lou Williams. I mean, well, can we just do away with the six man of the year award right now? Just give it to him. 
for the Clippers. Lou Williams. Just give it to him. It's his. It belongs to him. Nobody else needs to even waste their time. With what he's doing coming off the bench for the Clippers and with the bevy of injuries that they've had, Blake Griffin can't stay healthy. DeAndre Jordan just twisted his ankle. Austin Rivers was hurt. Lou Williams keeps going. Keeps going. Just give him the sixth man of the year award right now. But getting back to tonight's game, this game should matter to Cleveland. I'm a person who believes it should matter. It's not just another regular season game. And here is the reason why. If you're talking about just LeBron, it don't mean much. LeBron's going to be LeBron. But when you're talking about the collective whole coming together with one agenda, one goal in mind, then you got yourself an issue. Tristan Thompson's gotten back. He's productive off the bench. You want to give him some time. You started the season off starting Kevin Love at the five because you got to get set to go up against Golden State. And Kevin Love is more of an offensive threat than Tristan Thompson although he's more of a defensive liability. Then you have the situation where Isaiah Thomas comes into the lineup and he's a bit rusty. He's got to get his legs out, his legs under him. And we have no doubt that he's going to be effective offensively. The problem with him, however, is that he's a defensive liability because his miniature five foot nine frame. When you think about the fact that the smallest person on the court for the Golden State Warriors is usually Steph Curry, who happens to be the greatest shooter in the world, who's a legitimate 6'3", which makes him about four to five inches taller than Isaiah Thomas, you got yourself a problem. And then, of course, we got to get into J.R. Smith, who was sulking because he didn't start, but then ultimately got inserted in the starting lineup at the expense of Dwayne Wade. And to, in fairness to him, he probably deserved to start because they went to three straight NBA finals with him in the lineup. And he worked his tail off in the offseason and was totally committed. And then Dwayne Wade comes and he's, and Dwayne Wade's inserted into the lineup, even though Dwayne Wade's a three time champion. But the reason why I say that I, I, J.R. Smith should have never been taken out of the starting lineup is because Dwayne Wade is a true champion who is class personified and has the intestinal fortitude and a wherewithal to deal with coming off the bench a hell of a lot better than J.R. Smith could deal with being relegated to the bench. And that's the deal. So you have all of that going on. And you look at that and you say, Tyron Lue's got to figure this out because he's got to figure out how to bring the personalities together while at the same breath, making sure that he understands that some people deserve more minutes, some people deserve their minutes sacrificed. So with all of that coming into the equation, what do you have going on? It's a big deal. And going up against the Golden State Warriors, when you're in the midst of a three-game losing streak, having lost seven of your last nine, eight of your last 11, and you've given up over 100 points to opponents on 30 of the 41 occasions you've had a game this year, or 31 of the 42 occasions, whatever it is. You ain't playing defense. And what do you think is going to happen to the Golden State, to the Cleveland Cavaliers? If they don't play defense tonight, Lord have mercy. Now, in fairness to Cleveland, I was there a couple of years ago when Golden State was up by 43 on them in Cleveland and beat them by about 34. That season, Cleveland won the championship. So in fairness to them, I understand people's thought process about a regular season game does not make a championship, and that is fair. The flip side, however, is this. You're not the team that you once were because Kyrie's gone. Crowder's there. Isaiah Thomas is there now. Derrick Rose is there now. And your chemistry is disrupted. You got to figure out a way. And guess what? It ain't just on Tyron Lue. It's also on LeBron James. It's his team, right? They're your guys, right? You are the leader, correct? This is what comes with it. We'll see what they do tonight. I think it'll be a nail biter. I really, really do. But we shall see. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Your call is to close out the show in a minute. It's Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Well, I hope I can make him proud or made him proud. You know, um, you know just um, just taking what he was able to 
you know, give to us and, you know, give us that type of um, empowerment, give us that, that type of strength to be able to go out and, and talk about things that really matter, you know, and uh, be able to live for something that's more than you as an individual. Um, so hopefully that will be one of those guys that would made him proud. Hopefully I'm making him proud still with him looking down on us. The guy in control has given um, people in racism, you know, in negative racism, an opportunity to be out and outspoken without um, without fear, you know, and uh, and that's the fearful thing for us um, because it's, it's with you and it's around every day, but, you know, he's allowed people to come out and just feel confident about doing negative things. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, we can't allow that to um, stop us from all, you know, continuing to be together and, 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 and preach the right word of, you know, of living and loving and laughing and things of that nature, you know, because will we want to live anywhere else? I don't think so. We love this place. That is LeBron James, best player in the world, one of the iconic sports figures of our time, one of the top two as far as I'm concerned. Um, you're listening, you were listening to him just now, a speaker this morning, shoot around before tonight's game between the Warriors and the Cavs. Uh, he was speaking at shoot around. He was speaking about racism. He was speaking about President Trump. Uh, whose policies and uh, rhetoric since he came into office have been repeatedly challenged by LeBron James and others like Steph Curry and others. And so uh, it's more than appropriate to hear LeBron James praise the greatness, uh, the profound influence that the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had upon us all. Um, and on a day like today, it was certainly apropos to play that sound from him speaking about Dr. Martin Luther King, about civil rights and about, what he believes to be is a step in the wrong direction. If indeed uh, rhetoric and what is perceived as being allowed and encouraged by the president of the United States himself is what can lend itself towards dividing us. So that's what you got that from. That's what that was LeBron James speaking uh, earlier today. This is the Stephen A. Smith show right here on ESPN radio, 888-729-3776. It's 888-SAY-ESPN. The NBA is on ESPN radio. Tune in tonight as Steph Curry and the Warriors, the reigning defending champion Warriors. Visit LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Coverage begins at 7.30 p.m. Eastern on most ESPN radio stations. Back to the phones we go before we get on out of here for the day. Make your points real quick or I'll do them for you. Billy in South Carolina, you're live with Stephen A. Go. I just need three quick points. Um, first of all, the game yesterday in New Orleans and Minnesota is probably the, the best game that you'll see in the playoffs all year. Um, you have to tell Carton the truth or it set you free, and it's probably going to be in New England and Minnesota. And as far as Martin Luther King concerns, I think he could have been, should have been, would have been probably the first black president of the United States. And I'm white and I date black girls. So I'll talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mike in Texas. Mikey in Texas. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. Hey man, how's it going? Uh, I'm all right. Go ahead. Quick, quick Chris Rock reference. If it ain't new, it's through. Uh, I think it's great for the NFL to have these young teams, young quarterbacks. Hold uh, on, Mikey. Hold on, Mikey. Hold on, Mikey. That's fair. But let me ask you a question. As of right now, do you want to see a Super Bowl with Blake Bortles against Nick Foles and Case Keenum? Minus Nick Foles, I think I still think it's good. They are I'm saying, start would you rather? I'm saying, would you rather see that rather than Tom Brady going up against Philly or Minnesota? Nope, because I, I, I do want to see Tom Brady lose. Now, personal reference. All right. Reference. Got you. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate the call. Kevin in Houston, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. Hey, what's up, Stephen A.? Obviously, Talk today to is a very special day for us young black women, black men and women. Yep. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, I mean, obviously he wasn't with me, but he's helped me succeed it, and we got to fight our way as black people. We got to show people we're wrong, and that's what I love doing it. But getting into my Steelers, Oh, man, man, oh, man. That Bill Curtin defense was a mistake, and I hated it so much, Stephen A. Less than 24 hours ago, I feared. I feared, and I was getting ready to cry. I get Mike Mitchell. I saw his comments on first take. I saw what he said. But if you are an analytics and you look back to this season, you are really surprised that the Steelers are 12-3 and because that defense just got crushed, and Chris Boswell had to come and save us the game. I'm so disgusted in this. And I got you. I, I, I got you. I'm going to stop you right there because I got to go, and you're just getting emotional, and that's my job. You ain't getting away with that. But have a nice day. Appreciate the invitation. Cam in Florida, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. Hey, Stephen A. I'm just calling to say about the Eagles. I feel like this is season is pretty much full circle. This last Super Bowl run we had, we played the same two teams. 
I feel like the winner of this game, we go, to, we beat New England in the Super Bowl. It's a rematch, or we play Jacksonville, the city that we lost in. So I feel like this season is coming full circle. What do you think? Uh, I don't know about that. We'll have to wait and see. Minnesota's going to have something to say about that. And I, just because you lost the Super Bowl in Jacksonville, ain't got nothing to do with the Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, the fact of the matter is, you'd have a legitimate beef if Carson Wentz were healthy and, t- and you going up against Tom Brady. That would be special because I got news for you. If Carson Wentz was playing, there would be no doubt in my mind that the Eagles would win the Super Bowl championship this year based on what I'm seeing in these playoffs. I would have the Eagles winning the Super Bowl championship. I just can't believe, can't fathom the idea that Nick Foles is the guy that's going to take you there. He might take you to the Super Bowl, but I don't see him winning it. It'll be either lose next week or he'll lose two weeks after. That's my opinion. But I appreciate the call. Virgil in Virginia, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me real quick, Virgil. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying, Mr. Smith, you need to stop hating on Blake Bortles. You don't have to be an elite quarterback in the NFL to be successful. You don't have to be an elite quarterback to win the Super Bowl. Need I say Lynn Dawson? Need I say Jim McMahon? Trent Need Dilfer. I say Trent Dilfer? Yep. Need I say Doug Williams? You don't have to be Stop an right elite there. Stop right there. Stop right there. I did not say you have to be elite to win the Super Bowl. A matter of fact, Jacksonville is a legitimate threat. What I said was, if you had the chance to see Blake Bortles against Nick Foles or Case Keenum or Tom Brady against one of those elite defenses in the NFC, what would you pick? That's what I said in terms of what you'd rather see, not whether or not Blake Bortles could be the quarterback that gets it done for you with an elite defense. Understand the difference, learn to listen, and call me back tomorrow when you inhale and fully comprehend what the hell I said. I got to get on out of here for the day, but thank you all for being with me. I'll be back in 22 hours right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Until then, peace and love. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.